Hello, NYSOA Nation. Welcome to the 2020 NYSOA Summer Educational Series. My name is Lance Van Heitzma, and I am flying solo on this voyage as your host slash moderator for today's webinar. This is the third installment of the Rules Changes sessions following our session last week, Saturday, regarding video review and the distinction of violent behavior one, two, and fighting. If you missed any of the previous rule changes or professional development sessions, uh, they're available on, on the NYSOA YouTube channel, and that is found youtube.com slash NYSOA. We highly recommend subscribing to our YouTube channel in order to receive instant notifications of when educational content has been uploaded. We're thrilled to continue to offer experiences that engage, educate, and inspire our members to be better every game. Typically, this is where I would kick it over to my co-pilot, but today I will cover the rules of engagement. We encourage you to be part of the conversation, but there are two ways you can connect. The first is by using the chat feature. And if you'll notice, the chat feature is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, okay? The chat feature is where you're gonna make comments um, and, and other, uh, other comments that you're gonna have about either the, the presentations or things that work for you or, or just some regular banter. Uh, we ask you to keep it professional. Um, also, You'll have a Q&A feature, and that's where you will use to answer, ask your questions. Now, it's very, very important that you put your questions in the Q&A, because if you put them in the chat, they will get lost and they will go unanswered. You can also like someone else's question in the Q&A, which gives it more weight to be answered. I will be monitoring the chat as well, as, and also the Q&A section. Your video is currently turned off. So there will be no uh, video screens of, of yourself, you know, in your living room or hopefully not in your car. Uh, unlike previous summer educational webinar series, we will not be using the polling option today. However, we will be asking for volunteers and calling on attendees to participate uh, with contributing an explanation to the video or photo still shot during this session. So please be ready and be prepared. If you are called upon to provide analysis or an explanation, you'll receive a notification on your screen. When you do, please unmute yourself to talk. Now for the introductions. This is what we've all been waiting for. First, the returnees. 6'6", six, six shooting guard from North Carolina, number 23. Oh wait, wrong script, sorry. Oops, wrong legend. Uh, ours hails from Haddonfield, New Jersey current NCAA Secretary Rules Editor and NYSOA Hall of Fame Class of 2002, our very own Ken Air Jordan Andres. Uh, our next, hang on one second. Our next returning clinician resides north of Chicago in a beautiful town on, the lake, on lake Michigan and is a member of the NYSOA Hall of Fame Class of 2010. He's also NYSO a Senior Director of Instruction. Please welcome Dr. A. Todd Abraham. Joining us remotely from the NWSL Challenge Cup in Salt Lake City, Utah, where she and other NYSOA members, Jennifer Garner and Tiffany Turpin, will be working the NWSL final tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. ET on NBC Live. This is our Managing Director and Ray of Sunshine on a Cloudy Day. Please give it up for Tori Penso. Our last clinician needs no introduction, but I will give him one anyway. He's the current conference assigner for the Division I American Athletic Conference and the NAIA The Sun Conference in Florida. You may know him as the senior pro slash MLS referee, not because of his game count, but because of his age. Uh, but I know him as the heir to the pizza dynasty in Dover, Ohio, and Tori's husband. Please welcome my dear good friend, Christopher Robbins Penso. Now, before we get into the uh, rule change session, I'd like to pass the mic to Ken for our weekly update from the NCAA regarding the fall season. Ken, please take it away. You're on mute, Ken. You're muted, Ken. How about now? Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you know, we, this is the third 
uh, edition of the NCAA rules. And what I would like to do before we kick off and really get into the guts of restarts, uh, give you a little bit of an update. Um, yesterday, uh, the NCAA Management Council, the Board of Managers, met uh, and they discussed uh, the future uh, for fall championships and they did not make a decision yesterday. So those folks will be meeting again on August 3 or 4, at which time we'll get an update uh, with regard to fall championships. Um, basically, the message at this point is for everyone uh, to keep your fingers crossed uh, because we're still trying to play uh, and we may not be getting a determination uh, for several more weeks. So it's important that everyone uh, who is interested on the officiating side stay up to date with the rules uh, and keep your physical performance uh, and training going on. Um, nothing has been decided. I know folks are asking about spring seasons. Uh, the answer at this point is we simply do not know yet, and I will keep you posted. But we did have a couple changes and updates already that really are related uh, to the COVID-19 issues. So the rules change for 2020-21. And again, I'm going to say this is a rules change. So it goes forward under rule 12.7.4.2. Spitting at an opponent is now violent behavior two. It is a two game suspension. Spitting at an opponent, call it as violent behavior two, like we discussed last week, and then follow the appropriate format. Make sure that if you issue a red card for spitting, that you let everybody in the park know it's spitting, it's two games, it's violent behavior too. Now, if we're, I don't know if we're gonna have the chance uh, to update the electronic rule book, uh, we'll send out a memo to that effect. Now, we also uh, have what are referred to as waivers, not rule changes, meaning that these waivers will be in effect at least for the 2020-21 season. Number one, the coaching and team area will now be extended 20 yards from the midfield stripe. And that's clearly done to allow for social distancing. So you're going to see an extended area. Uh, it will be permissible up to 20 yards. And if it goes further than that, uh, please be smart about it and say thank you and let it ride. Now, the second aspect under Rule 5.5.2, in previous years, if we had a paper scorebook and box score, you were required to physically sign it. This year, you will not be required to physically sign the box score. You need to verify it to make sure that disciplinary cards are accurately recorded, but you will not have to sign it. And that's simply done uh, for COVID transmission issues. Now there are a few other areas. Ken, can I ask a question about the bench area? Because uh, this had come up, I think earlier, you had talked about the bench area being able to extend back also to give the players more space. Is that also part of that waiver? Uh, not specifically, but I would tell you that if a school makes provisions for additional social distancing and it's back toward the stands, uh, let it go. You know, don't create a problem for yourself there, particularly when someone is trying to do something for student athlete safety purposes. Now, there are things in the works with uniforms. Um, for sponsorship reasons and bylaw reasons, um, NCA has been pretty strict as to what can and can't be on a uniform. There are different issues being discussed now, uh, frankly, uh, as a result of things that are happening in our country. 
right now you can have one patch that would either be a US flag, a conference flag logo, or a school logo, limited in size. You have to have two numbers, front and back. You could have the school name or nickname, and you could have a player's name on the back. It's not decided yet, but it is very likely that the NCAA is going to sanction another patch that will likely have something to do with social justice issues. So you will expect to see something in the future uh, and it might say uh, Black Lives Matter or eliminate racism or words to that effect. The Student Athlete Council is going to vote on that and that's something that'll be used nationwide. Now the other thing that's going to change and I'm gonna read to you in all sports, allow other names or words intended to celebrate or memorialize persons, events, or other worthy causes on the back of the player's jersey where the player name was traditionally located. So you are liable to see social justice issues appearing on the back of a jersey. Black Lives Matter. Uh, something having to do with the uh, the LGBT community. The point on this is from a referee perspective. The schools and or conferences will make decisions as to what those names or words will be. You as a referee will not interfere in that process. It doesn't matter whether or not you agree, disagree for political or other reasons. If a school or conference sanctions words, logo, phrase, you are to permit that jersey to be worn and you are not to do anything about it. You don't issue any disciplinary cards. If someone complains about it, you make a note and you make an issue that's reported in your game report but you do not take any affirmative action. Everybody good with that? Not our job. Now last, during the national anthem, if players, team personnel, decide that they want to take a knee, not your issue. Don't interfere with anything like that. Again, you know, whatever your personal feelings are on something like that, the NCAA has recognized uh, that that is a freedom of speech issue and something that is now very important uh, in the social context uh, of our country. So if someone takes a knee, uh, bows their head or something like that during the national anthem, they are permitted to do that under NCAA guidelines in all sports. Do not go looking for trouble. Do not initiate a problem with these issues. So from my perspective, uh, those are the things that are happening within the last two weeks. Nothing changed uh, with regard to the interpretation uh, of handballs, offside, violent behavior, one or two with the exception of spitting and fighting, and nothing has changed uh, with regard to restarts that we're gonna learn about today. So that's the quick update. Um, come back next week because we'll probably have an update. You're likely going to see other COVID related issues coming from the sports science department of NCAA, such as masks being required for team personnel who are not participating in the game. So stay tuned, uh, we'll get you that information. Uh, and I'm looking forward now to learning uh, about the details of restarts. Great, thanks Ken for the update, appreciate that. And um, I think that's helpful for everybody to know where we stand as the situation continues to evolve. So uh, today- I thought I just saw something, saw a quick question. Yep. What if a crew member takes a knee? 
absolutely permissible. Great. Thank you. So our agenda for today, we'll go through a rule change overview again just to set the stage. We went through video review changes, uh, one of the two previous sessions. We'll talk today about restarts and the drop ball. Uh, accidental handling, we talked about on a previous session as we did with violent behavior one, two, and fighting. These can all be seen on our YouTube channel. We'll talk today about free kick restarts and wall changes. Uh, the changes to goal kicks and other restarts in the penalty area and the goalkeeper restrictions on penalty kicks uh, once again uh, we talked initially about the ifab and nca differences and we won't be going through those in detail but they are all available on our youtube channel and if we move to the next page we'll do the quick rules um, overview uh, obviously this is a year of significant change uh, none of us involved in in this process can ever remember so many changes in one year so this is a year that we're doing a lot more work around making sure everybody is up to speed on the changes that the NCA has brought to bear this year. And the intent of these changes is that are more closely align the collegiate game with the international game. However, it's important to realize that not all of these changes that IFAB had undertaken in the last two years have been implemented by the NCA. So it's important that you still understand the differences and officiate by the rules that you're being asked to officiate by, which are the NCA rules of the game. Uh, these changes require not only changes in the rules themselves, but also in our mechanics. And we'll talk about mechanics changes specifically in this session because a number of the restart changes require changes in both referee and AR mechanics. And we also should expect some tactical differences coming from these rule changes. As you know, we've moved our training and instruction online this year because it's very difficult in most parts of the country to get large groups of people together, if not impossible. And therefore, we ask you to please use Ask a Rules Question feature on the NISOA website to get clarity on anything that isn't 100% clear to you as a referee. And to use your informal network with your colleagues and chapter members to talk about some of the situations that you might be facing in this upcoming season. So the rule changes. Uh, coaching and team areas, we've talked a little bit about this. Uh, Ken just talked about the changes associated with coaching and team areas, but the change in the rule that preceded some of the COVID changes was allowing electronic devices for, ref for team participants to communicate with each other wherever they happen to be. So if you see any, a team member or an official in the team area using an electronic device, that's perfectly fine. We talked about video review, adding a fifth item to correct timing areas. That was in last week's session. Uh, protests now are limited only for situations to involve or player identification and or legal participation. So this is significantly limited the number of areas where protests will be um, entertained. It doesn't, if anything, it means we have to be more vigilant on operating under the NCA rules of the, of the game and making sure we don't confuse the IFAB laws with the NCA rules. We'll talk a lot about restarts today. We talked about accidental handball last week and about the fact that if the player gains possession or control of the ball after it's accidentally touched their hand or arm, which results in an immediate goal scoring opportunity, um, results in a goal, or having the goalkeeper directly throw the ball into the other team's goal. This is, uh, these are all now considered uh, unacceptable. So moving to the next page, violent behavior one, two, and fighting. We re redefine the fighting rule to narrow it just to those things that everyone would consider a fight. And most of the things that were part of the expanded fighting rule prior to this year now fall into violent behavior too, including spitting, as Ken mentioned just a minute ago. And so again, the differentiator between violent behavior one and two is intensity, uh, mal intent, and the ability to do harm to the opponent. And, uh, and that's something that we need to make sure that we stay on top of. And that session from last week shows some really good examples on YouTube of the difference between violent behavior one and violent behavior two. 
Uh, free kicks as well is something we'll talk about today. And um, we'll talk about goal kicks and violent behavior, uh, I'm sorry, and penalty kicks. Just want to pick up one thing off of another slide here that I'm looking for, just to make sure I, I say this. So again, the key differentiator between violent behavior one and two is premeditation, malice, and severity. And I think it's important to remember those three aspects as we continue to, to, to deal with items and behavior, trying to differentiate between violent behavior one and two. So something that's premeditated is extraordinarily severe and demonstrates malice toward an opponent is categorized as violent behavior too. And so those are the, the main areas for today. And with that, uh, let's move to the next slide, please. And we'll go into drop ball here and turn it over to Chris and Tori to pick up from here. Thanks, Todd. Thank you, sir. Welcome, everybody. Lance, thank you for the... Uh, Fantastic introduction. Uh, I'm thankful you didn't show any mustache pictures. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah, so we're going we're to cover the thrilling topic uh, of drop ball and restarts. You know, one of the most exciting things we can do as referees and officials. So, uh, Tori, can you help us with the proper way to drop a ball? Absolutely. So I have a balloon here. I'll show you like this. Fantastic form. Is that That's good? Fantastic form. Good? And drop ball. Yes. yes. And as Tori uh, just so eloquently showed us, it's impossible to screw this up. <laughs> Actually, you can. Yeah, you <laughs> probably a lot can. of things involved. And I know restarts isn't the most sexy topic, especially as, as it relates to the new rules. It's imperative that we understand the, the nuances because it's going to help us manage the game. And a lot of these are restarts are protestable. Um, so it's really critical that we understand and know um, our restarts and the best ways to manage them. So run us through uh, drop ball mechanics, Chris. Sure. So under the new rules, uh, all players, teammates, and opponents uh, need to be five yards from the drop ball. Uh, so as uh, under the new rule, uh, all drop balls uh, are uncontestable, right? So we only need one person uh, to drop the ball to. Uh, as referees, we want to assess uh, the, the potential problem areas, uh, probably discuss in pre-aim how we want to uh, keep an eye on certain things when the referee has his back turned to certain areas. Uh, as referees, we want to have a position where we can see the most in view uh, and put our back to what's where the ball is least likely to go. Um, and then just a friendly reminder that a player cannot uh, score a goal uh, from the drop ball, but he can touch the ball more than once. So under the new rule, since the drop ball is uncontested, we drop the ball to the player and he or she's free to dribble as long as he wants, he or she wants. Uh, but cannot score a goal until the ball's touched another player. Uh, going back to a comment that Tori made, uh, just a reminder, under the new rules, uh, restarts are not protestable. Uh, in the old days, they might have been, just because about everything was protestable. But uh, thanks to the hard work of the Rules Committee, uh, we've axed a lot of those. So restarts are no longer uh, something that you can protest. So going into uh, 9.3.2, because we like to use all these numbers in the NCAA rulebook, uh, temporary suspension of play, in case of temporary suspension of play due to an injury or any other cause, there shall be a drop ball. As we said, drop calls can no longer be contested. Everybody has to be five yards away. The player who takes the drop ball can play the ball as many times as he or she wants. They just can't score a goal. Um, possession is not a consideration for a drop ball. So when we stop play, and the ball is in play uh, to deal with an injury or maybe the ball hit the referee and we have to have a drop ball. The drop ball is given to the player who last touched the ball. And then all drop balls in the here. penalty area. Go ahead, Tori. So one thing, having um, executed this new rule um, on the IFAB side, um, it, this can be a teamwork element, right? It's difficult to remember who last touched the ball, particularly when you have 
two players colliding, you have a head injury, you have something else that you're trying to manage as a referee. Sometimes it's very difficult to keep all this in view. Where was the ball last? Who last touched it? So use your teammates. And I've now added this into my pregame and I encourage you all to as well, to encourage your teammates, whoever's closest, to help you with not only the location, of, but also who last touched it and help you verify that. Um, because it is a team effort. Likely for stopping the play, it's because of something significant like a head injury or something else that is significant. So it's important that we work as a team to make sure that we get this right. Um, because I will say it is it is challenging to remember who last touched it. And you'll see in the clips a little bit later, um, we'll ask this question. It's important for you to also be aware of it um, when viewing clips as well. So um, I would say use this as an opportunity to get your team engaged and, and put a little onus on all of us to get this one right. So Tori, what mechanic, if you are not mic'd up with your referee crew, what mechanic are you recommending? Great question. So I would always look to my crew before I restart to verify we've got the right location and we also have the right restart and we also have the right possession, right? Um, so if we've stopped for a head injury and I don't have, have comms, maybe I would look at my closest AR or my fourth if I have one and just say, hey, Chris, just to verify it's white's drop ball here, correct? And he would say, yep, you got it right there, right where you're located. And we would maybe have that verbal confirmation. Very good. Just uh, a couple of things here I, I want to throw in. Uh, I mean, I agree. It's really hard to screw up a drop ball. But remember that it's a drop ball. It's not a ball thrown to the ground. So you don't take the ball and see how hard you can bounce it into the ground. The balloon was a great example. Uh, but, I mean, we've seen many um, less experienced referees, let's say, think that the drop ball is uh, how hard can you throw it down to the ground and see who can get it. The other thing, obviously, with the drop ball now being uncontested is you no longer have an out on who did the ball last go off for a ball into touch. Very rarely did we ever use that, but when we weren't sure, we always had that opportunity to drop the ball if we weren't sure which team got the throw in. Obviously, that's no longer an opportunity for us, so we have to be 100% correct and sure about balls out of play. Just a couple of reminders on things like that. Yeah. Good points. Good points. And then as a reminder, you know, the one place on the field uh, that it doesn't matter who last touched the ball is anytime we stop playing the balls inside the penalty area, uh, the ball is automatically dropped to the goalkeeper uh, inside the penalty area. So if the ball hits the ground, they can pick it up. You could just drop it in his hands. Really, right? We can bend the rule book a little bit here. Um, but anytime that we stop playing the balls in the penalty area, the drop ball automatically goes to the goalkeeper. So last slide here on drop ball, we've got some, some videos to go with it. Uh, but if play was suspended, like we just said, with the ball in the penalty area, it should be dropped for the goalkeeper. So a uh, quick clip here to go with this one. So we notice the referee does well here to stop play uh, right away. We got a green player down on the penalty area. Goalkeeper has the ball in his hands. Referee stops play, beckons the medical staff on. You know, as referees, we always want to be uh, safety minded. And anytime we suspect there's any any potential for a head injury, uh, and there's a good clip of Lance uh, here coming up. But anytime we have a, a potential head injury, we want to get the training staff on right away as soon as we can. Uh, and have the player checked out. So you notice here, uh, before we, as the video plays on, the referee here has an opportunity to, to manage a bit with a goalkeeper. Thank you, Doug. And during the stoppage, the referee has the opportunity to go to the goalkeeper and say, hey, it's going to be a drop ball. We could all do ourselves a favor and probably say, hey, hey, uh, would you mind giving me a second or two to get up a field, right? And we don't take advantage of that here. And as you'll see, the goalkeeper uh, immediately throws the ball and puts the referee in a bad spot. So just uh, take the opportunity, take advantage of the opportunity to, to manage with the goalkeeper, converse with him or her, and say, hey, I'm going to drop this to you. You're going to have it in your hands. If you could be fantastic uh, and just hold the ball for a second or two and let me get uh, upfield. If play was suspended with the ball outside the penalty area, as we've discussed, it should be dropped for one player of the team that last touched the ball at the point of the last touch. So go ahead with the videos, Doug. And as we alluded to, the wonderful Lanceman Heitzma. 
the Indiana player takes the ball to the head and Lance immediately stops the clock, beckons on the trainer, even though she's up. Anytime a player takes a ball uh, to the head at the speed of which that shot was taken, thankfully didn't hit Lance. We want to stop play right away and beckon the trainers on. And now we've seen from the video, uh, when Lance blows the whistle, the last player to touch the ball would have been this player. And as such, Lance would drop the ball to red number 16. So in the next clip, what we're going to do. Chris, can yeah. you hang on just a second? You've talked about this, but I need to reemphasize it. Yeah. You don't make a decision as to whether or not someone has a concussion. Your decision in college soccer, is there any chance at all that there is a head injury? That's your decision. You don't decide and you don't, uh, it didn't look that bad or something like that. If there's any chance you stop play and remember now uh, with the substitutions, it's not gonna be a problem. You might save a kid's life someday. And I'm not being over dramatic with that. No, stop absolutely. play, it's college soccer. Absolutely. That's right, Ken. We can't emphasize that enough. I mean, we say it all the time in all of our presentations. Anytime we talk about uh, rules and interpretations, it's always safety first. The safety of the student athlete is our paramount responsibility as officials. So Lance does well here to stop play right away, back in the training staff on, and obviously the restart under the new rule will be a drop ball to red uh, right here. And someone asked a question in the chat box here about who gets to drop ball. It's for the team, not necessarily the player who touched it last. So it doesn't have to be the player that touched it last, just someone on that player's team. So just because 16 goes off here, it doesn't uh, goes off the field to get her, her head injury dealt with, uh, doesn't cause any sort of problem because it could be anybody on, on Indiana who can receive that drop ball. That's and something correct. to add here, you notice that player gets up quite quickly after she makes contact, right, with the head. This Again, player safety, first and foremost, Lance does a great job to stop play and get the trainer on. Nobody complains about him stopping play and getting the trainer on for a head injury. You're not going to get any heat for that. So if we can err on the side of caution, even though she gets up right away, it doesn't matter. Get that trainer on. None of us are experts, as Ken has just alluded to. It's important that an expert gets to attend to her. And player safety is first and foremost. It's not entertainment value here in collegiate game. It's all about the player safety. So it's so important that even though um, she may have gotten up kind of quickly, let's just go ahead and wave that trainer on and handle it. I think the couple clips we've seen, they've done a really good job of that. Um, continue to do that, especially with head injuries, always over index. Um, stop play immediately and bring them on. We now have this drop ball that gives possession right back to whoever had it, or if it's in the, the, the penalty area, we can give it right to the goalkeeper. So there's no risk. Um, here, and it's just best if we just err on the side of caution. So wanted to reemphasize that because you do see the player kind of get up quickly there. Yeah, next club tour, you want to take this one? Sure. Why don't we bring somebody in to help us discuss this? Lance, can you find us somebody? Sorry to make you sit up in your seat and get engaged here. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so you'll see we've got an injury. And if somebody wants to take this. Michael please. Ziegler. All right. Michael National Ziegler. referee from RWISOA. All right. RWISOA in the house. Love it. A member, a member of the New Era Officials roster of officials. Oh, how about that? Double time. So if, if Michael is in, you can unmute yourself and join the conversation. And Doug will replay this video. And if you can walk us through what happens, what should be the appropriate restart and any um, advice or changes you might have to how the restart was administered. Uh, we left, he exited, the, we called on him and he, he left. <laughs> anybody, let's see, can somebody, anybody wanna raise their hand perhaps? I got one. Okay. Ross McKernan from Tysoa. Ross.
Ross, you here? Hello. Yep. Hi, Ross. How are you doing? You guys doing well? Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Oh, absolutely. Fabulous. So we've got a clip here. Obviously, the topic yep. is uh, restarts. So if you can walk us through what happens, um, what the appropriate restart should be, and um, how the restart is administered, any changes or suggestions you may have. Okay. okay. Right. Well. Doug, if you want to start it from this top. Yeah. You come through the top. Of the wall there you there. go. All yours, Ross. Okay. Well, uh, well I would stop the play here. Let's see. It looks like there's a slight challenge there on uh I, I, okay. the, foul or no foul play colors, foul, oh, foul yeah i'm calling foul um right okay. play continues here mm -hmm. and plays continued I, I would have stopped play okay so what does the referee do instead and, uh, well he so, uh, Ross, you still there? All right, I'll, I'll pick it up where Ross left. So the referee allows play to continue and the red team, I believe the red kicks it out in which he, Casey stops play, arguably perhaps just before the ball is actually out of touch. Um, with the new drop ball law rules that we have in place, we can stop it immediately. We don't need to necessarily wait until players kick it out of touch here. Um, so there's an opportunity for us to maybe stop it a bit sooner as opposed to allowing the players to hopefully maybe um, put the ball out of, out of play here. Um, and if we have sound on, you can see the, the referee brings the whistle to his mouth almost just as the ball's going out of touch. Um, so I think our restart would also not be a throw in here. It would be a drop ball um, considering, but um, encouragement to us. We also see some water balls getting tossed on the field here. Um, so let's just be mindful we're managing everything on the field, including water bottles, um, and make sure that we have a drop ball quickly. There's no need for us to, 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 to wait when we have an injury. Let's go ahead and get that drop ball administered. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next one. Thank you, Tori. Last bullet uh, under drop ball. If play was suspended as a result of a ball striking an official or object outside the penalty area, we have to restart with a drop ball for the player or team or player of the team that last touched the ball, the location where the ball struck the official or object that was on the field of play. So Doug, if we can go to the videos. Um, I don't think that's the right video. No, that is not the right video. <laughs> that, is a, uh, that is a goal kick. That's a goal kick video. All right, give us one second as we get that. Does anybody want to take it? Do we have somebody who wants to raise their hand and talk us through the clip? As Doug finds the next clip, here it is. Here we go. Cool. Yep. Chris, you want to walk us through it? Yeah, Lance, do we have somebody uh, in the chat that would like to handle this one for us? Larry Pachone. Larry. Larry, if you want to unmute yourself. Hello, you guys hear me? Hey, Larry. Yes, hey, Larry. Hello. I had a feeling Lance was going to call me. Uh, okay. <laughs> I had a feeling. Is that a good feeling? <laughs> Uh, we are, I should get lottery tickets tonight, that kind of feeling. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, why don't you walk us through this clip? What do you see? It's hard for me to tell where the ball, if, if blue or gray initiated the touch that hit the referee. Sure. The second, I thought it was gray. And if it hit the referee, went back to gray, I was sort of wondering maybe the ball did not change possession. Correct. But it sort of gained, I would think, more of an advantage because the ball sort of shot forward. 
Yes. Um, so I think my instinct would have been, regardless of who touched it, because it all of a sudden it made a promising, a promising attack, stop play, and then a, a drop ball for Gray. I think Gray last touched it. Perfect. Well done. Well done, Thanks, Larry. Larry. Good, good pick, Lance. Yes. Good pick. And Larry is right here. So we'll see in the clip that the Wake Forest player plays the ball. It bounces off the referee. And instead of the pass uh, going east-west like the player envisioned, the pass now goes to a player uh, in who's entering the attacking third and creates a promising uh, an attack. So under rule, we want to stop this play and restart with the drop ball. Mm -hmm. Initial out. questions in regards to possession. And just a friendly reminder, because it starts a promising attack, because the ball does go forward, we would then uh, stop and allow a drop ball here. Okay. Awesome. Let's go to the next clip, Doug. One last, one last clip. Lance, do we have somebody we want to bring in? Let me take a look here. Uh, yes, Brandon Stevis from California. Nice, so a fit uh, every week with Brandon. Right. Right, Brandon. Are you Brandon here? Yep, I'm here. Fabulous. Why don't you walk us through what you see? And then also, um, in regards to the way that the restart is administered, is there anything that you would do different given the new rules? Yeah, so it, from what I saw, I was, um, it looks like uh, the ball plays off the official and changes to possession. Um, so we want to give a drop ball back to the team that originally had possession. Do you know who that was? Uh, about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, should that be orange? Should we get back to orange? It goes to gray here. Perfect. And then, yeah, we, we, we want to give them at least five yards, you know, uh, per the protocol, not be dropping it right there with them facing each other. Perfect. So talk to me a little bit about that. How would you manage that situation? Yeah, so I think, you know, we, get t we take our time here. The referee really rushes things. Just, you know, get them away from players, give gray a chance to kind of retreat. Tell them, you know, back up, back up. And then, you know, once you drop it, say, you know, you're, you're good to play so that they don't just, like, kick it back. You know, so right now I feel like this first year you get to coach them a little bit. So um, just don't be, don't be afraid to baby them. Be like, this is your ball. Everyone else get five yards away, and then we're going to play. Because they don't quite understand it yet. That's, that's a great sample, Brandon. And like you said, you kind of have to coach them a little bit. Yeah. That's what I do. That's what I've been doing here. I just say, hey, guys, new, new rule, right? Yeah. New rule. Just a friendly reminder, this is new. You need to back up and I'm going to drop it to you uncontested, right? And just be really clear about it. Because like you said, you kind of have to coach him. What were we going to so, say, Chris? Brandon, question for you. As uh, if you're the referee in this in this video, knowing that we now have a drop ball uh, to Clemson, to the Orange team, how would you, uh, how would your body orientation look for this drop ball? How would you set yourself up? Well, um, I'd probably, you know, kind of, like I said, give it a little more time for everyone to kind of get back into their normal positions. And I would probably give it to, you know, someone in the, de the defensive piece of Clemson and probably face upwards. So that way I can kind of see, you know, where everybody is on gray and kind of just make sure there's no one around him that could kind of sneak in there. Um, just kind of open the body up and have the head on the swivel and make sure there's nobody around. Awesome. Fantastic. Nice work, Brandon. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so Chris, Tori, let me just jump in for a second here just to remind people, because we didn't say this explicitly in the PowerPoint. There are three areas that the rules now uh, require us to give a drop ball if the ball hits the referee. It's only play is only stopped if the ball goes directly in the goal after it hits the referee, if it changes possession, or if it creates a promising attack. So just one of those three things must happen. So just having the ball hit the referee doesn't initiate that drop ball situation. One of those three things must happen. So we have to make sure that uh, when we do this, we recognize that if one of those three things didn't happen, then play continues. So if the ball goes directly out of play after it hits the referee, the referee is part of the field and play is restarted with that throw in. If the play continues without creating a promising attack, you don't stop the play and just allow play to continue. So again, we don't have this explicitly in the, uh, in the PowerPoint presentation, but want to remind everybody, one of those three uh, conditions must be met for us to have a drop ball.
It's, it's almost like looking at an advantage situation or perhaps a disadvantage situation. Just because the ball touches the referee, if it doesn't matter, play. Perfect. Good points. Thank you, guys. So now that we have a good sense of drop balls and a better clarity on when and how we administer them, let's move on to free kicks and some of the changes in regards to free kicks. So first and foremost, general mechanics when it comes to wall management, with or without spray are, are very similar, right? So we want to set the, the position of the ball, mark it if you have spray, that's great. Establish the position of the wall if you know you're 10 or if you need to mark it off. Um, you can use the spray to uh, draw that line and instruct them to stay there in that line. And then of course, you wanna make sure that you've got somebody to cover handling in that wall. So you can either ask your, your trail official or your fourth official, or if you can get in a position to see the wall, that's great as well, but make sure somebody on your crew can handle handling in the wall. Um, and then you would then retreat from there. Um, I always like to, if the wall is in the penalty area, take a, a brief moment to have a conversation with uh, the wall and just friendly remind them that they're in the penalty area to make sure it's even more critical to keep their arms down as it would be a PK, right? So just have a small conversation. It's a good opportunity to have some management, some interaction with players as well. And then you wanna make sure you move yourself swiftly into position by keeping both the ball and the wall and the drop zone all in view while you're moving, okay? This, Sounds very difficult, <laughs> but after you've done it a number of times and you figure out your body orientation, um, it's actually a really good um, repetition. The spray can be a great help if you have it, and if you don't, no problem at all. We've done it for years without spray, uh, and it can be easily administered. What's important now and what's different from typical wall mechanics is the number of players in a wall. So if there's one or two players there, no problem. As soon as a third player enters in, it now officially becomes a wall as we now define it. Okay, and so what that means is now we have to be aware of any potential attackers who are in and around the area of that wall. So if you see an attacker who's closely approaching, just friendly remind them, be proactive, say, hey, gotta stay a yard away. If they come up and press up against the wall, you're gonna wanna stop play and manage the situation. So they need to be one yard away from that wall. Okay, so you can either, if you have spray, you can use the spray and just mark a little line of where they need to be. Um, you can also um, have that proactive conversation with them. Once you have everyone set and in place, you can signal for the restart. And that's always with a whistle, particularly with ceremonial kicks, right? Um, any further action by the defense, i.e. adding people to the wall, does not result in any type of infringement. So that's important to note. And then any further action by the attacker, i.e. they move closer, that you set that one yard and they've moved in, they've encroached that one yard, it's gonna result in an indirect free kick coming out, i.e. negating that free kick opportunity essentially. So really important, this is a big difference for us. There's an opportunity for us to effectively manage this and be proactive in referees so that we don't have that, that indirect free kick coming out and we're taking away the advantage opportunity, okay? So there's a lot for us to be aware of. This is another thing I've added into my pregame as well. So putting it onus on our referee crew to make sure we get this right. So if we see an attacker coming into that wall, I tell my crew, alert me. A lot of times we have the advantage of communication devices to do that. If you've got beepers, you've got that as well as a tool. But I would also add this into your pregame and something to communicate with your team and make sure everyone's aware that maybe you set the wall and did your thing and then someone here comes an attacker and you didn't catch it perhaps so that your crew can alert you and that you can manage it proactively because there's a lot of onus on us as referees to make sure that we proactively handle this. So that is free kick uh, in general and wall management and the changes there. Let's go to the next slide, Doug. So again, those definitions, when there's three or more, that really defines a wall now. Um, if there's one person or two person, obviously, you know, you still have to manage certain things, but it's not necessarily the attacker that you have to be concerned about coming in until there are three or more. So that's important to note. And so I think we have a couple of videos, Doug, if you can share. Perfect. So here's an example of a referee who's setting a free kick. He's got the position. He doesn't have spray, no problem. He's talking to the attacker. He's pointing to his whistle saying, hey guys, it's gonna be on my whistle, which is really important as well. There it is. He tells the goalkeeper that, that's awesome. And he marks out his 10. And you can always talk to the players as you're doing this. Hey guys, come on back here with me. And that helps them move back as well. So he gets his line right there in the penalty area. I also like to take a minute to say something to the players there, just to say, hey guys, friendly reminder, keep your arms down, you're in the penalty area. Don't want us to have any penalty decisions here, right? Uh, and then we allow 
the kick to be taken. So here was a definition of a wall. There's more than three defenders here. There weren't any attackers in the area, so there wasn't really any proactive management required by the referee here. Okay. Let's go to the next clip, Doug, if you will. Here is another example of an attacking free kick. The referee calls the foul, has some management with the player, very verbal and demonstrative, nice and firm communication. And then he sets his ball. He's doing a lot of talking to the players. You've got an attacker right there. He tells them some words and then he marks off his, his 10 yards here. Again, we have more than three defenders here. So this is gonna be a definition of a wall. And you can see an attacker starting to walk over. So we need to be aware of this, right? Uh, luckily that attacker stays a good bit distance away. We might wanna say a word here just to prevent and be proactive. And now everyone's in the right position. We've got our attackers all within one yard of that wall, no problem. And we signal for the start of the kick. Okay, so those are two examples of free kick management. Fantastic. And if we want to go back to the slide. Thanks, Doug. An attacking player cannot participate in a wall with the opposing team if, when a free kick is taken, an attacking team player is less than one yard from that wall. Um, formed by three or more defending players, an indirect free kick is awarded. And again, if we can be proactive and manage effectively here, that is the preferred method. Um, and then I believe we have a couple images. So Doug, if you can show this next image, this will show an example. Of, there it is, perfect, thank you. So here is an example of an attacker pressed up against a defending wall. And you might be familiar, you've seen this probably quite a bit. So this is where we need to make sure before the start of the kick, we are moving that attacker one yard away. And again, kind of like Brendan said earlier, um, this is new for everyone. So it's a bit of coaching that we need to do. Just a friendly reminder, hey guys, this is a new rule. Make sure we back up, here's your one yard. If you've got the spray, then I would use it to mark that, that spot of where that uh, attacker needs to be. I think that's a really helpful tool in this instance. And then once you signal for the restart, if they encroach from there, then you call that indirect free kick coming out. Doug, can you show the other image that we have? Perfect. And this shows you exactly what it should look like. So we've got that um, defending wall with more than three people. So it's effectively a wall as we define it. And then we have the attacker just one yard off that referee is managing that effectively. And that's what it should look like. Now, again, if he encroaches after you've signaled, we're going to have an indirect free kick coming out. Okay. And given the severity of that penalty, this is one thing that you want to manage proactively. This you're taking away a goal scoring opportunity from someone and giving the other team an indirect kick coming out. So this is not a gotcha situation. It's one of those situations you want to manage. And what you're looking for is the attacker either not following instructions or moving closer to the wall after you indicate the restart. Perfect. Thanks, Todd. Absolutely. And this is, puts a lot of onus on us. Um, as managers of the game to be as proactive here um, because it really does take away an, a great opportunity. So uh, the last bullet here, when a free kick is awarded to the defending team and the penalty area and the ball is um, in play once the kick is taken versus when it actually leaves the penalty area as it was previously, um, it can be played before leaving the area. So we have a clip here, Doug, if you can show it, fantastic. So here we have two players battling, we've got a free kick and we've got a quick restart in the area, no problem here, okay? So previously we've had to have left the area and now we can allow this kick to, to commence, okay? You probably have seen this happen um, a few times. So that is free kicks. And now we're gonna go over to goal kicks and I'll hand it off to Chris. Corey and, and Chris, uh, let me interrupt for just a second. Absolutely. Um, talk to us about dealing with attempts uh, by players in the wall to create a violation. Because a lot of coaches have said, hey, I know that people are going to tactically try to place an attacker now in a situation where he and she, he or she is creating a violation. So talk to us about managing that, please. Yeah, so I think, this new rule brings a lot of opportunity for us to showcase our management skills, right? 
I think that's why I like the opportunity to talk to the wall because you can also friendly remind them of the new rules and your expectations that they do not merge or create any contact here. And likewise, you can do the same with the attacker. So I think free kicks, when we acknowledge that we have an attacker within proximity, we should stop the kick, make sure it's ceremonial, make sure we make sure that we are there having communication with both the wall and the attacker and setting our expectations. And if nobody, if they don't follow through and that attacker does come over, we have an indirect free kick coming out. If you've got that defender inching over, you can manage with your voice and your words. Um, and I would say, you know, if you've got the defense shifting over, I think it's on you of how you want to effectively manage that. So keep that in mind. Um, at the end of the day, this is going to put a lot on us to make sure that we're being proactive in managing. And I would say making sure also that our team is alerting us. So if your referee isn't aware of it and you've got an attacker coming in, seeing how you can communicate to them if you've got the comms um, or a beeper flag or something of that nature to help inform them that they need to manage this effectively. Because this is new for us all and we're all um, you know, on a learning curve. Yeah. And, and to Ken's point, what you might expect to happen is a team says when the referee blows the whistle, I want the entire defensive wall to move to the left so that you're right next to the attacker. In that case, the attacker did nothing wrong. The defensive wall initiated the proximity and the attacker should not be penalized as long as the attacker didn't move. So if you see those kinds of shenanigans by the defensive wall, don't penalize the attacker because that might very well become a defensive tactic you now see from teams that are trying to leverage this rule change. And then just to wrap this up, I think this all, as Tori mentioned, it all comes back to, uh, to us as officials, this area in the rule book for us is going to force our hand to really showcase uh, the preventative tools that we have in our referee toolbox. So uh, man management, player management uh, will be really important in this aspect of our game now. So. On the goal kicks and other restarts in the penalty area, such as free kicks, uh, and defensive uh, restarts. So the AR now should be positioned even with the second to last defender. It's a, a small tweak in our. It's a small tweak to our positioning uh, as the system referees because we no longer have to ensure that the ball is penalty area. Uh, so now it shifts back to our number one focus, which is even with the ball or the second to last defender. Uh, Doug, if you can show us the first video. So here we have a ball uh, that goes out. The decision is a goal kick. And the AR is going to hang back or should hang back. Uh, now we're going to have defenders that are going to remain closer to goal. We're going to see this as a tactic now since uh, goal kicks don't have to leave the area. But you're going to see defenders stay back and give your goalkeeper options for distribution, which as referees uh, as well, this is going to change our tactics in positioning. We're not going to go as deeper uh, unless – we see all the players come up field and we know the goal kick is going to be sent long towards midfield. We want to uh, be careful we don't get caught cheating in the event that we see more goalkeepers playing more short balls and distribute out of the back. So as assistant referees here, which is the, the highlight of this club, we want to make sure we stay back and even with either the ball or the second to last defender. Back to the slide, Doug. And as I just mentioned, the referee needs to be alert to quick restarts. Uh, and contested balls in penalty area. And we're, we're going to for sure see uh, more short balls, more building out of the back, less goal kicks sent uh, long. And so as referees, we have to make sure we tweak our positioning and we're ready for those in that change in tactic. The leading AR needs to assume more responsibility for long clearances in the event that the referee does, does get caught. Maybe they set up for it to be a short goal kick. Referee sets uh, sets up for a short goal kick, and the goal kick is quickly sent long. So the lead AR needs to have uh, some broad shoulders here and accept some, some more responsibility in the event that that happens. Chris, can I add something here? Yeah, go ahead. And really, at the end of the day, I think goal kicks were something that maybe we were uh, robotic almost in our, our positioning. Like we would just call the goal kick, we turn up field and get in a position, right? And now this is a very dynamic free kick, right? It could go short. We could have high press. We could have a quick turnover and a, and a goal scoring opportunity, right? And a decision perhaps, right? Or it could go long and we could be going on a 60 yard run, right? So now it is a much different game um, when it comes to the goal kicks and teams 
typically have um, a standard approach to how they may handle it. And you can pick up on it after a couple of goal kicks, right? Um, it might be that they have two of their defense kind of hang back and then the goalkeeper kind of waves them up pitch, right? And in which case you can read that and do the same yourself. Um, when Chris says, make sure you don't get caught, I can speak from experience here. <laughs> and this just comes back to, um, you don't want to give in too much either way, right? Because if you go too far upfield and they play it short and you've got a quick press and now you've got a goal scoring opportunity, potentially a, a PK decision, a dog so decision and you're way upfield, um, now you're in a compromising position, right? And you're expecting your AR to help out. Um, so we just need to be more dynamic and it gives, we might have to have a 20, 30 yard burst of speed after a goal kick is taken, depending on where the ball goes and where they play it. So goal kicks are no longer tweet, blow your whistle, turn up field and get in a position. We now need to be um, head on a swivel, more aware um, and, and being prepared for what the next phase is. Cause you're seeing teams high press and they're getting turnovers at the top of the area or inside the area. And, and having a goal scoring opportunity. So uh, really important that we are aware of that. And this also ARs, if you are on um, a team and your referee's not recognizing it, you've got to take a little ownership as well because you might have a big decision to make um, and make sure we get it right for the crew. So all need to be aware goal kicks are no longer um, what they used to be. And we also know, again, the teams tactically would sometimes touch the ball before it left the penalty area to get a, re a different, a second attempt at that goal kick, knowing that if it didn't leave the penalty area, historically, it would be a re-kick. That's no longer the case. So early in the season, you have to be aware, again, for players doing that, thinking that that's going to stop the play when indeed ball remains in play. And you could have some uh, strange things happening there as well. Strange things is a great description for it, Todd. <laughs> I think we have a clip that we can bring somebody in for on the next one. Lance, do you have somebody? Let me take a look here. Hang on one second. Yes. We are going to bring in... We're going to bring in Vito Rizzi. Uh, one more time, Todd. Right, Vito. Welcome, Vito. Come here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Okay. Um, I guess uh, the uh, the ball was kicked out uh, behind the line. Uh, the the goal the goal uh, keeper is going to take the ball, put it down, and uh, and play. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's redo it. Okay. Yeah. What do you notice about the referee? Uh, the, the referee uh, is got to take his position, you know, uh, 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 somewhere close to the, uh, to, to, you know, at a three quarter uh, to make sure that uh, there's no, in, in, uh, no problems there. You can, you cannot just run in the middle of the field. You got to stay in that area to, to make sure that everything is okay. Mm -hmm. And do you think he reads the pressure? Excuse me? Do you think he reads the pressure here well? Uh, I think it's too far out as far as I'm concerned. It should be a little closer. Yeah. yeah. So there's a couple of indicators, right? Before the kick is taken, we've got a tacker at the top of the defensive, right? Um, and another one. So as soon as they play it, you see both these players kind of challenge for the ball, right? And our referee is yeah. still backing up. Right. Right? It's, it's too far out. It should be a little closer. Just to, you know, uh, I, I don't see the referee at this point. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, yes. could be, it could be about uh, about five six yards closer to the to the uh, uh, to the eighteen yard. Yep, I would agree with you on that one, Vito. Thank you. Anything else? Any other suggestions for the referee? Um, not really. I guess at this point, you know, we consider just a goal kick. Yeah, go ahead and keep playing it, Doug. And but you can. See you need you need to perform an immediate risk assessment on this. And what I mean by that is where is a game critical event likely to happen? Is it going to happen at the top of the box or is it going to happen at midfield? So if somebody plays the ball long and you have a problem at midfield, you can deal with it. But if you're not ready now to play, now we have a problem where maybe we're 12 yards out. So you need to be where the game critical events going to potentially occur. And if you go back to the beginning of this clip, if you would, Doug, and just play it from the beginning again when the ball is played, I just want you to notice the position of the players here. 
So you've got the goalkeeper and the one defender that are back in the penalty area. And then you have two attackers that are closer than any of the other players on the defending team. So if the ball gets played short, which it does in this time, you've got uh, two defenders, now defenders, two attackers, two players in the black shirt against that one player with the ball. Uh, this is a situation you're going to need to be closer to than 40 yards away. And you can see that when the play is set up. And so the fact that in this situation, the referee isn't moving closer to the top of the penalty area is an issue. And that referee should be getting closer to that. And to Ken's point, if they get blasted long now, you'll have, you'll have a better chance to recover. And that's why we know that the lead AR now needs to take more responsibility for any long ball actions. Thank you, Todd and Ken. Great points. I like the risk assessment um, from Ken, because I think that's exactly what you need to do is evaluate. I think we have situational awareness and anticipating in the chat from Brandon Will. Thank you very much for those added points. Absolutely. I think the players are telling you that they're going to high press here and we should expect the referee to read that and start to kind of come back um, a little bit towards the top of the area because we could have a turnover and we could quickly have a, a goal scoring opportunity. So we need to be aware of that. And if you as AR see your referee starting to move up field and you have attackers, I, in my pregame, have requested my ARs to tell me through the comms, pressure, 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 or attacker, um, if the attacker lingers. So some things to um, take into consideration in your pregames as well. And it's also helpful for the, uh, if you have comm system, when the ball is in play to say balls in play. Because sometimes we do turn our head and start moving back upfield as the referee. And now with these short kicks, you're not sure whether the ball's in play or not, or if it's just getting set up for that goal kick. So uh, that's not a bad, a bad mechanic as well. Yeah. Thanks, Vito, for your commentary. Appreciate joining. Yeah, thank you, Vito. All good points. Uh, last bullet on this slide. The defense can still wait for the attackers to clear the penalty area. Because as we know, uh, the defenders... Uh, obviously can play the ball inside the penalty area. Now the attackers need to be outside the penalty area unless they weren't given the opportunity to retreat. Um, the defense can still can wait for the attackers to clear penalty area, put the ball in play and may still play the ball to the teammate in the penalty area. So the last, last clip, Doug. So you notice here, the ball goes out for a goal kick. The goalkeeper is quick to put it down. The Clemson players, uh, which are the attackers, are retreating. You see the one, Doug, if you can go back just a couple frames and pause it uh, a couple more right here. So you'll notice we have a Clemson attacker on the far side of the penalty area, kind of near where the referee is. If the ball is played quickly towards him and he hasn't had a chance to, to leave the penalty area, this player can still uh, challenge for the ball. The goalkeeper assumes the risk here because he puts the ball in play and the attacker hasn't had time to leave the penalty area. So go ahead and play it all the way through, Doug. But thankfully, he plays it uh, to the other side, and the ball is now in play. And uh, the Clemson players have the right to uh, challenge for the ball now. Chris, that was a great point. And if you went back, Doug, to that point where that, that player was still in the penalty area, I don't know that the referee is aware that, that that attacker is there in his body orientation. So really important for us as referees to have our heads on a swivel and even backpedaling a little bit further than maybe we have previously so that we are aware of where all the attackers are. Are they making an effort to get out of the area or are they pressing? Um, Cause that's an important differentiation for us as well. Very good point. Great. Before we go to penalty kicks, I just want to make a, one point on the restarts because I've seen a couple of things in the chat that I just want to make sure people are aware of. Uh, we talked about drop balls in the penalty area all going to the goalkeeper. That does not mean that all restarts in the penalty area, indirect free kicks, are drop balls for the goalkeeper. An indirect free kick for the defense in the penalty area is still an indirect free kick. It hasn't changed to become a drop ball. So if there's an offside, for example, is still an indirect free kick in the penalty area coming out. So there were some questions here about whether all indirect free kicks are now drop balls for the goalkeeper. They are not. Indirect kicks are still indirect kicks. All drop balls in the penalty area for the defense are for the defense and can be dropped directly to the goalkeeper or anybody on the goalkeeper's team. Great. Good point. So now that we have a good understanding of drop balls, we have a good understanding of goal kicks. And like we said, 
Um, these things are changing the way in which we manage and move on the field. Um, we also have some adjustments in penalty kicks. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so in regards to positioning of the goalkeeper during penalty kicks, um, and we add a bit of a violation and penalty for uh, goalkeepers who move on the line. So we'll see an example here. Until the ball is kicked, the opposing goalkeeper shall remain on the goal line with at least part of one foot touching or in line with the goal line, facing the kicker between the goal posts without touching the goal post crossbar or goal net and is permitted to move laterally that is side from side. So um, for example, I did some penalty kicks here in Utah for our semifinal match and the goalkeeper came in, she gets set on the line and she jumps up and hits the goalpost. And now we've got the goalpost shaking. So we have to wait until the goalpost stops shaking before we take the kick. We can't take the kick with the goalpost shaking. So that's important to know. Um, I also took the liberty to have a little conversation with the goalkeepers, knowing that this is a new um, law and IFAB rule for NCAA. Um, go ahead and have a conversation with the goalkeepers and just a friendly reminder that they need to keep at least one foot on that line and just point at your AR and say, you've got a fabulous AR today and they're going to keep a close eye on that. Um, and luckily in NCAA, the first offense is a warning and then the second offense is a caution and then if it continues beyond that hopefully it doesn't um, then you would you would administer so forth um, so important differentiations there um, I know in IFAB for the following year it's different but as of right now um, these are differentiations for IFAB so important to know so again goalkeeper has to keep their foot on the line I think we've got two images Doug if we can show those perfect so here you can see that goalkeeper has his right foot on the line he's perfectly timing this um, save he's going to make here um, and this is acceptable. I know his foot is kind of behind, but it is on. So if this is an acceptable. We would allow this save to commence. And then if you can show the other clip here, um, again, you can see the goalkeeper's foot, back foot is on the line here. Don't mind all the encroachment. We're only looking at the goalkeeper's um, position here on this clip, um, but you can see how one foot is on the line. So this is permissible. So again, um, definitely make sure you cover this in your pregame and how you want your AR to inform you if something is not administered correctly, i.e. the goalkeeper does step off the line. Um, make sure we are in line in teamwork and understand what it is that is expected of us. Um, so please make sure you address that. And of course, again, the penalization for it, the first offense is a warning, um, which I think is helpful. And if you have a second offense, uh, caution and so forth. So important differentiations on the penalty kicks. Anything to add here from anybody? Yeah, I, I, there are questions again coming up in the chat where they're not supposed to be. They're supposed to be in Q&A, but I'll answer them anyway. If we do go to a penalty kick tiebreaker, uh, those cautions from the match do carry over. This is a rule difference between IFAB and the NCAA. So if a goalkeeper has been cautioned in the game and then, or a, pl or a kicker for that matter, and then they receive a second caution, during the penalty kick tiebreaker, they are ejected. That is the second yellow card. That is a continuation of the match. So right now, that is a rule difference between IFAB and the NCAA. The tiebreaking procedure is considered part of the match. Great. Thank you, Todd. And I think this also is important for us as managers of the game to make sure that we are doing everything we can um, to not give any soft yellow cards to goalkeepers. So say, for example, if there is, um, we have delay at the end of the game, right? Um, let's do our best to manage that as effectively as we can. Um, not that we want to avoid giving yellow cards where yellow cards are due, but let's make sure they're hundred percent yellow cards when we're giving them um, as it does um, you know, impact uh, potentially when we have a, a penalty kick. Um, and if you do go into a penalty kick and you have a goalkeeper on a yellow card, let's make sure we just friendly remind them of that um, and make sure that we are as aware as well as referees um, and that's everyone on the team. All good points. So here is a wonderful table that helps us understand um, the different actions, whether it be encroachment by the attacker, the defender, uh, the attacker and the defender, um, and whether there's a goal or a no goal, meaning um, what is the end result, and then what would be our um, retake or indirect free kick coming out or allowing the goal. Um, I find this chart to be tremendously helpful. Um, I have one similarly printed that I will have with me tomorrow while we are out at the field. Um, so making sure that you guys are familiar with charts um, like this and bring them with you on the fields if you need to, um, should we have um, opportunities for penalty kicks. Um, it's important for us to know that. And of course, um, the illegal fainting, um, it would be a warn and or caution. That's the difference there um, from IFAB. So important to note that as well. 
Any other questions or comments in regards to penalty kicks and infringements? Uh, Tori, I have to step up and take a hit. Um, I don't know who the secretary rules editor is or was um, when he or she drafted the rule book this year, uh, whoever it was made a mistake. So would everyone please make a mental and a written note as well? Under rule 14.2.5, 14.2.5, there's a mistake. Uh, the rule in the book reads, the player taking the kick shall kick the ball forward in order for it to be in play, period. All good. Back healing is permitted, providing the ball moves forward. All good. Next sentence. Whoops. If the ball is not put into play properly, comma, the kick shall be retaken. Uh, that is an error. And if you look at the penalty kick infringement part in the chart, uh, you will see that when the ball is not put into play properly, it's an IFK coming out. So please make that note. If you look at the rule and the approved ruling, they are in conflict. The approved ruling is correct. The approved ruling says on a penalty kick, the kicker passes the ball back to a teammate who shoots and scores. Approved ruling, no goal. The game shall be restarted with an indirect free kick because the ball shall go forward on a penalty kick. Uh, so I'll make sure that I speak to the secretary rules editor and make sure that he or she uh, corrects this. But make a note in your book, 14.2.5, uh, there is a mistake in the rule. The approved ruling is correct. Uh, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa. Thank you, Ken. I'm sure whoever the rules uh, person is, is they're human as well and they can make mistakes. So I'm going to talk to her as soon as we get off today so she doesn't make a mistake like that again. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Ken, for the clarifying that point. We appreciate it. So that concludes all of our um, restarts and the new rules. And thank you guys all for joining. Um, I've got this little quote up here, train when no one is watching to be ready when, when everyone is. So continue all of your guys' hard work off the pitch um, of joining these webinars and learning um, so that we are ready when it is time to get on the field. Lance, over to you. All right. Sorry, we were very active today in the question and answers, and I apologize if we did not get to your question and answers. Um, we will make sure, please make sure you attend on next week's Sunday session, so that way we can answer these questions uh, that you may have. So first off, thank you, Ken, Dr. Todd, Tori, and Chris for this world Lance, class. Before we wrap up, I, I want to clarify something because there's been a bunch of stuff in the Q&A here that I'd like Ken to just weigh in on. I, I think I know the answer, but I want to make sure we get the official ruling on this one. So Ken, there's been some questions in the Q&A about the ball hitting the referee and then going out of play into touch. And uh, my understanding is if the ball hits the referee and goes into touch, then it's not a drop ball. It is a throw in for the team. And that's consistent with IFAB. Is that the way you understand the rule that we are consistent with IFAB on that interpretation? We are consistent with IFAB. Damn it. Now, if you look at, and Tori pointed this out before, on one of those clips, the referee blew the whistle before the ball went into touch. So now we've got to drop ball because the referee blew the whistle based upon the fact that the ball struck the referee. But if it is a situation where it's referee directly into touch, we've got to throw in. And so I assume you can manage the game in a way that when it hits the referee and is clearly going into touch because of the referee to stop the game before it goes out of play. Sure. Be proactive on this. And, and that's sort of, uh, and I think it was a clip that Tori presented. You could see that the ball struck the referee 
and all the players were just like, okay, what are we going to do now? We're all getting ready to stop. And then somebody plays the ball into touch. You need to read that situation right then and there, blow the whistle, drop ball. Don't let anything bad happen. So again, the intent of these changes was to align NCA rules with IFAB laws. So yes. if there's some things that we talked about that you think are in conflict, please bring those questions up next week when we do this. But the intent is for these to be the same. So don't be looking for differences in this area. We've pointed out the differences, like on the penalty kick situations where the misconduct carries over from the game to the tiebreaker, where cautions are not mandatory, but rather uh, discretionary for the referee where the first infringement is a warning, not a caution. Those things we've highlighted. But on sure, and the other one, Todd, uh, and we brought it up, I'm going to say in day one, um, if there is an occurrence where you would normally caution someone, but you play on in a promising attack, in college soccer, we want that disciplinary card issued. Under the IFAB law now, you're playing and you're not coming back to get the player. In college soccer, you're coming back to get that player. We're trying to eliminate uh, the unsporting conduct every chance we get. That's why uh, we are carrying cards into penalty kick shootouts or kicks from the mark. We understand what IFAB's doing. We just simply disagree. It's a sportsmanship or sporting issue, and we want it dealt with on the college level. And I unfortunately, I have to remind us every session, and I'll do it again this time. I just want to remind everybody that uh, we play by the NCA rules, whether we like them or not. And so if there's some things you don't agree with here, then tough. You've got to play by them. The NCA requires we do that. So just remember that. And also remember, please, that these sessions will be available on our YouTube channel. And additionally, we will have materials on our NISOA website that'll demonstrate rule differences between NCAA, IFAB, and for those people who do high school games, the Federation as well. So we'll maintain those uh, reference items and those resources for people to continue to understand what's different and what's the same. Anything else, Ken, you wanted to add about that before Lance? Does his no, I'm good. Great session. Over to you, Lance, then. All right. Thank you. First off, thank you, Ken, Todd, Tori, and Chris for the webinar. A special thank you to NISOA's official broadcast partner, Never Ends Production. Doug and Lana are in the production studios in Fort Wayne, Indiana right now. We appreciate all the time and effort behind the scenes it takes to put on this world-class webinar week in and week out. There's a survey reminder here. I'm going to go ahead and put this in the chat. Please fill out this survey. This survey will help us uh, formulate uh, future educational opportunities as well as uh, uh, questions for next week's rule, uh, rule session regarding question and answers. There seem to be a lot of questions regarding the restarts of play, especially drop balls. So please put those questions in the survey so we can answer them. As mentioned previously, this is the third installment of professional development series this summer. Well, actually the rule change session this summer. Please visit NISO's YouTube channel for a wide variety of education specifically for the collegiate game. It's critical for our entire NISO family to be prepared both physically and mentally when, when ready to take the field at the opening whistle of the collegiate season whenever that may be, okay? Um, don't forget about the weekly trainings with Coach Trent. If you're looking for some training opportunities, running workouts, adhering to local government social distancing guidelines are posted each Monday on nysoa.com. And Coach Trent is live every Saturday. Today, I believe it was at noon. Uh, he was either at his tropical playground, aka his, his outdoor gym, or he's at a remote location such as Empire Fitness. If you're unable to attend the live fitness session, you can always watch the workout and do the workout later on uh, 
uh, using the recording on NISOA's YouTube channel. When uploading photos of, of uh, post-workout on social media, please use the hashtag NISOA fit and then tag at NISOA.DOT.com and also at Tori Penso for a chance to win prizes such as OSI gift cards and Lululemon gift cards. Drawings will be done in the near future. The more post-workout pictures you upload to social media and use the hashtags and tags I previously mentioned, the better your odds are of winning one of the prizes. Additionally, tag a NISO member or two and challenge them to do the workouts with you, remotely, of course. Our goal is to fully prepare our membership in anticipation for the start of the season. We strongly encourage our membership to take advantage of the live sessions, joint host webinars, and topics specific to professional development. Please visit NISOA's YouTube channel for any missed education and fitness sessions from 2020. Additionally, you can review educational content from the 2019 NISOA Summit and fall series titled Making of a NISOA Referee. We have created a summer full of virtual experiences that will engage, educate, and inspire our members to be better every game. We look forward to seeing everyone next Sunday, August 2nd at 11 a.m. with our special guest clinician from ECSR, and then again at 5 p.m., Eastern time for a live Q and a regarding the rules changes, as well as an update on the NCAA season with Ken Andrus. The content will be different in each webinar on Sunday. So we hope to see everyone virtually uh, at both events. So please stay healthy, stay safe and happy whistling. Thanks again to never ends. And thanks Tori and Chris and Ken for your participation today. 